data analysis of. This, this turns out to be pretty important, I think, for, for business technology as well as art and philosophy. Uh, and the last claim that I make is that if you, if you really want something to hang your hat on or, 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 that isn't so esoteric, data really represents relationships. It represents the relation of, of you, uh, of you, the audience, to me, me to you, me to this light source, this, my presentation, this projector. Everywhere along the way that we might be trapping and analyzing data, we're really just looking at the relations between things in space and time. Data, so the title of this, let, let's start talking about that, break that statement, data is down. Uh, so this is a, this is a little, little slide about data about other things. So this is the common stuff that you, the, the stuff that you're used to talking about and seeing and analyzing all the time, right? We always talk about in databases and, and Hadoop and whatnot, uh, specific data types. Uh, I'll extend the idea of a data type to things like electromagnetic fields, gravitational fields, et cetera. Uh, and then ultimately, a lot of what we talk about at conferences like this, and even in the art world, you have tools and materials and canvases and whatnot, you have detectors of that data. So you got things, events, things that are happening out in the world, and you got things to detect what's happening. What well, just so happens, the majority of what we deal with in life are specific detectors. Those are instruments, measurement tools that we've built to detect a specific kind of data from a specific data source. So let's talk about data as other. So this, is, this isn't data as a representation of other things being detected by a detector. This is data as an actual object unto itself. I think today's world is actually helping my philosophic argument quite a bit because we've been able to construct objects in a much more obvious data-driven way than we ever have before. So some examples, we're now 3D printing meat and organs, and these are actually going into bodies in the real world, but we know exactly how we engineered them. We know the entire design. They are essentially data objects. Uh, we have all this weird augmented reality, uh, which really throws the question, you know, the old cheesy philosophic question, what is a chair, or pick your object. Um, I always like to give a little, a little side story about that. It's really interesting. If you've got kids that play Minecraft, uh, which I think is 100% of children population, I'm always amused by the first thing that they end up building for their avatar is a house and a chair, as if avatars ever need to sit down, ever get tired, ever need that. So it really it kind of has raised uh, the question for me again, what exactly is a chair and what is its purpose in something like Minecraft or virtual reality? Uh, obviously, the, we've got a raging gun debate in this uh, country, which is always super interesting considering the kind of weaponry available to, you know, tyrannical governments, as well as the fact that you can just 3D print guns now, so I don't know exactly what we're trying to regulate. Uh, really cool thing, it's kind of cut off there. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, or there's one in Europe. Uh, pretty cool place. Uh, they have a ton of, obviously, Dali stuff, but they've started to venture into virtual reality, where they're taking Dali paintings that, you know, he was always considered wacky and doing surreal things that are the impossible. Well, they're making them possible. They're making them real. There's an incredible VR thing that you can actually go, you can use Google Cardboard, you can get off of YouTube, or you can actually get an Oculus Rift kind of thing, where you can step inside his paintings, and artists and technologists have completely rendered his surrealism as real. I think it's really cool. Uh, the other thing here is something that Microsoft and a bunch of artists and technologists did. Uh, it's called Next Rembrandt. Some of you might have seen that, where they've actually deconstructed uh, Rembrandt's uh, canon. And they've been able to, uh, probably better than any forgery technique so far, reconstruct layer by layer, stroke by stroke, the Rembrandt process using, obviously, encoding you know, some, something programmatically, but then throwing it through 3D printers that are able to completely, like, almost perfectly mimic his material process. Uh, which, you know, for some artists that have existential angst, they wonder if that's really painting. Uh, me being somebody who came out of technology, if I could get a Rembrandt using a 3D printer, I would freaking do it every time. Uh, which really gets into probably one of my bigger statements, which is, really was Rembrandt, Vermeer, all these master painters, also master technicians. I'm sure some of you have done some of that. Uh, some of that history yourself. It turns out they were incredible technicians that were using the latest tools of the time. Vermeer, just, if any of you have seen that uh, documentary, Tim's Vermeer, who, the guy who recreated what he thinks was the Vermeer process, was actually an incredible optical 
uh, setup that he did to be able to re-encode the, the photorealistic environment that he was in. Uh, and so here, I really am calling to the fact that this was an incredible big data operation that they did. And in fact, I'll make a bigger claim that every time a technology company, a conference, an open source community wants to prove that we've got somewhere, we, we've actually progressed somewhere with the technology, we almost always do an artistic expression. Whether it's Deep Dream or it's AlphaGo playing games or whatever, it's always some weird, complex human thing that we have to prove the machines are now capable of doing. Okay, so we're going to go down the rabbit hole. Um, now let's consider data as the detector. Uh, with with the, the popularity of deep learning, neural networks, machine learning, uh, I like to ask the question, exactly what is the machine learning and how is it learning? Uh, when you realize, we all, we all kind of have, have actually learned this ourselves, that machine learning gets better the more data you give it. So at the end of the day, if you take that all the way to, I think, its, it's logical conclusion, machine learning is data itself. Your brain is made up of a network, nodes and edges. Uh, you know, most any kind of data science that we're doing at this point is almost a, a graph problem, a network science. Uh, and in fact, here, uh, you kind of, I, I imagine your brain is drawing a picture right now that is actually not anywhere on this computer. Um, I'll, for some of you, it, it may be a happy face. For some of you, it may be something else. Uh, but the point is, I, I, and I don't have a resolution to this, this is a very ancient question, which is, if, if there's a face, in fact, on this slide being presented through that projector, where exactly is that face? Where is that data? And it may seem like a cheesy kind of philosophic thing, but as you guys go back and think about your businesses and, and data science and the types of people you hire and the types of technology uh, that you're going to use, I think this is a very relevant question to ask because a lot of times we're collecting a ton of data that may not actually be the stuff we care about and vice versa. Okay, so let's, let's kind of tease this apart. So if, if networks our data and they're the detectors, exactly how, how does the process work? Well, I give you a couple of examples of just kind of replication and recursion. Uh, obviously, we know most of us have gotten the basic biology, but we're, we've expanded this with a bunch of synthetic biology. The idea of gene replication, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I pulled this cheesy picture together of 3D printers, printing 3D printers, printing 3D printers. Uh, it's pretty clear that that's going to be a real future. Uh, deep learning is now producing software. Maybe some of you are working on uh, automated programming. Uh, we'll have autonomy, like nature has always done a good job of creating replication and, and recursing autonomy. The key thing is, because of the halting problem, things don't always work. We, it, all of these processes want to be perfect replicas, and a perfect recursion, but the fact is things go wrong. There are physical limits, uh, and I, you know, I, don't, I don't know all the science, I don't think anybody knows all the science of why this seems to be so pervasive, the random mutation, quantum fluctuations, whatever it is, but the fact is, as is, is perfect as we like to, to make copies of things, things go wrong. This turns out to be super important. Though the things going wrong, and I don't even want to call it errors, but that's what everybody com uh, commonly calls it, uh, things just change. And then that change gets built back into the replication process. That's, in fact, learning. That's what machine learning is. That's what big data is. That happens to also be, I'll make the claim, that that's what art is. It's the process of recursing over ideas, and things change over time through the materiality, and you end up somewhere different than you started. So let's go down that a little bit further. Uh, interesting paper. Well, interesting to me because I'm, I have a lot of time on my hand to find interesting things like this. Uh, here's a, a snippet of a paper that uh, is using the mathematical group theory uh, to explain uh, atonal music theory, uh, which is you know, not surprising. Music and math have often gone together in research programs and as activities. Um, but I, I, in, in looking at this paper, I like to look at these kind of papers and these notations, not just as the information they seem to represent. Again, I'll remind you of our brains or networks that have information encoding them. You are bringing your awareness, whatever awareness you have of group theory, uh, typical looking math paper, and musical notation. Some of you may be musicians and you can actually plot right now. You're probably whistling that tune in your head. Which again, I say this piece of data means lots of different things to different detectors. Well, this piece of data is also 
simply marks on a piece of paper, and in this case, marks on a digital slide. I mean, we're getting really weird, but all these things matter. Because when you do a data science, you do an activity to try and figure out what we're dealing with, you sometimes have to go all the way there. If you want to understand all aspects of how group theory and music theory might actually be the same kind of science, you probably are gonna have to make sure that the symbolism you're using to represent them actually does represent the same science. In fact, that's, what a, lot, uh, that's a lot of what you do in mathematics. It turns out, you know, this is why Leibniz you know, won out over Newton as far as getting credit for a lot of things. You have better notation. So in all these things, when we want to understand the world, you actually have to think about data as all these other things. So another thing, and this is, again, relevant to the, the, the big events last week, but this is, we're going to start tying this together. I also think of data as maps. For the mathematicians in the room, mapping is a, is a very fundamental thing. and It's a very important concept. Uh, cartography has been a fundamental human activity for a long time. It turns out last week, the map was worth about $2 trillion to all of us. So it's actually a really interesting thing. And then obviously the example at the bottom, whether you believe self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles are gonna be a thing or not, if they are a thing, it's because they have a really good map, which of course all of us have been supplying to Google uh, for many years now as we leave location services on. Uh, so data as a map. And the big statement here that hopefully you can go away with, because I try and remind myself, that data is really a way to map one medium to another medium. OK, so now we're going to go to another one of those philosophical things that annoys you when you have to argue with your dad about anything important or whoever. Uh, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a noise? Well, I'm going to make a claim. I'm going to make a claim that in, in case of the tree being data, or the, the, the noise being data. In fact, if you don't have an observer, a detector, you don't have any data. Data definitely isn't something until something happens. You need to have an event. You need to have two things in relation. No matter how, many, how small that stuff is, whether it's bits or atoms or whatever, you need to have one object in relation to another object. Then you need to have something to detect that relationship. So. I like to think about two major events in, in the history of humankind. Uh, Immer wheat was one of the, one of the, what they call the founding grains uh, of agriculture. I think most of you probably know that we don't have human civilization. It doesn't arise until we have agriculture because you couldn't store fuel. Uh, but once, once we were able to cultivate uh, stores of food, then civilization rose. But it turned out to be one of the critical things was this wheat, this Immer wheat, uh, actually, just by the way evolution kind of does things and you get mutations and you, the right conditions exist, it had a fatter seed that could also travel further and, and, and work in that drier climate. And so it just so happened to sprout up crops that, they, that the early humans figured out how to mow and do whatever they were doing to it. Um, it's a pretty interesting and detailed history. Uh, but, I, but it's one of those things I like to point it out is like that, there was no concept of agriculture until something happened, and it was all a big giant accident in one sense. And then there had to be humans to notice, wow, we can do stuff with that and eat it, and we can store it. I mean, there was a whole bunch of data science they were doing at the time. And then we have the latest thing, which is probably one of the more abstract things I can think of, because none of us in our lifetime will ever be able to humanly, with our senses, detect this, gravitational waves. And in fact, the kind of event you need to have to happen for that data to exist is two black holes very far away have to smash into each other. And you have to build an instrument that is so sensitive that if you sneeze like three miles away, like you have to throw out all your data. So it's just, a, to me, it's a really, these are extreme examples of, you know, observer effect, et cetera. So, summarize. Data is, it's about others also about itself. It's self-referential. Uh, it's about relations. It relates other things to other things. Uh, it becomes through experimentation, through accidents, through serendipity, through the interactions of things that are different. Uh, learning is noticing and experimenting with these differences, playing with the relationships, whether, you, whether they're robust or not robust. Uh, in a sense, data science is experimentation, it's simulation, it's art. 
You're transmitting one, a phenomena that you observe over here to see if this medium also exhibits that phenomena. And a, a little bridging statement. Data that is really data. This is the stuff that you base your business on, your life on, your career on. That's data that is robust through transforming, through transmitting, through relating in other mediums. If the gravitational wave can only be detected by a single kind of detector in a certain circumstance, we're probably not going to believe the science. If the wheat that I was talking about only grew under very, very simple things and it was sort of an accident that one time it sort of worked, they probably wouldn't have built the whole civilization of agriculture around it. You need data to keep showing up. You need relationships between objects to show up in similar ways through different mediums. This is also the function of art. You see art themes showing up over thousands of years. We do the same kind of art because we use art as artists, but also people who do it for cultural reasons. You do it in business. This is an art project to show slides, logos everywhere here. We do it to relate whatever is going on in the world, whatever new information we have about the world into new mediums that, that we're moving into. So, because uh, I can't you know, divorce myself from thinking like a data scientist, uh, this is what I've been doing for the last seven months. I produced uh, 1,200 paintings. Uh, I've thrown two art shows. I've uh, composed or recorded 13 hours of video. Uh, I've sold 155 artworks. Uh, I've created over 14 million marks in some medium. Uh, uh, the locations where I've had two art shows, I've increased their revenue, single day revenue, by 38%. Uh, I analyze every single work that I do as far as that I can with the tools available to me. And I use Hadoop and I use Mathematic and I use all sorts of things to, to really decompose. Uh, and certainly because I can present it back to you, recompose this art as something. Um, you know, I've had some of my artist friends say, man, you're way too mechanical about this. It's just weird. I go, well, that's part of the art project for me. It's like, how far can I explore this? Um, the thing at the bottom you see is uh, I recently did a forensics of uh, all the, the video footage I took of my last art show in Austin. And I had, had a bunch of GoPros trapping as much of the, of the audience behavior as I could. And then I've been going through and doing a bunch of forensics on that actual video feed, seeing how people moved throughout the artworks, what they stared at, uh, what they talked about, how many times they raised their hand. It's really, you know, an illustration for you is in a three hour video, I can get terabytes of data out once you tease it apart. I mean, it's a massive data project because I also have forensics on all the art, the three or 400 pieces I showed at the art show. So I can actually start relating the human behavior to the actual artwork itself. Uh, this turns out that I was also doing this in conjunction with a, with a larger media company where I'm digging into some of their media to find these behavioral forensics out to help them you know, on the internet with what they're doing. So how do I relate all of that and not just be self-aggrandizing about my awesome art career that I'm having fun doing? Um, well, I'm trying to make a point here that art is it's really, for me, art is about making something happen. It's about noticing what's noticed, taking that data back in, and recursing on doing more of what's noticed. And it could be what you noticed, what the audience noticed. It could be a whole bunch of things. But the point is, it's a constant data science that you're doing, even if you want to call it art. I don't care what process we call it. They're functionally the same activity. Uh, as an example of a little experiment I did that Obviously, because it was art, I don't know if people viewed it as an experiment, but one of the things you had to do at this art show, you had to make a choice. You could go through the art show to the left, you could go to the right. If you went to the right, you were choosing truth. If you went to the left, you were choosing, uh, choosing self. And I was just curious, you know, what would have more sway as a, con as a concept? So there's like 130, 140 people that came to this show. 73% uh, of them went to the self. You can make some claim about our narcissistic culture. I want to learn about myself. Turns out they walked into a wall of like 30 of my self-portraits, so it was sort of a, a play on that. Uh, if you went down the truth side, um, you got a bunch of different abstract art. Uh, so 27% of the folks went that way. Well, I thought, well, is this, did, did I learn anything? Well, 
there's actually a bias for those of you that, that, that know this. 90% of the world's population is right-handed. We have a left turn bias. We just almost, I guarantee if you spend the rest of your day, and some of you will probably think about this, you'll walk out of here and you'll probably hang a left. And in fact, the conference organizers have made most of this stuff, you, you'll see it, it'll be left turned. They don't even know they're doing it, it's just what they do in the, in the natural bias of the body. Well, then I went spelunking, it turns out ants and almost every animal has a right-left bias. So I like this idea that ants, when they're, when they're exploring things that they don't know, they tend to go left. So humans, Exploring things tend to go left. I actually, the truth moved some people to go the other way. I think that's a win for truth on some level. So, okay, well, let's relate this to business. Uh, all businesses to me are art, and all art is a business of some sort. And I'm not trying to just make this some weird thing to justify what I've done to my career, which is probably not a good thing according to my wife. But I, I, I'm sincere in this. Business is about making and selling something, whatever it is, even if you've got one of these weird freemium models or ad models or whatever. You are definitely buying and selling attention on some level, buying and selling goods on some level. Uh, you need to notice, in, in most of our cases, notice what's happening, obviously through data. Uh, you want to notice what people are noticing. If you're a branding person, you care directly about that question. What are people paying attention to? Oh, and the last thing is you're recursing uh, into making and selling things more efficiently. As you learn things, you learn out things, you learn to do better things in the value chain. So the claim, I'll relate this back to the robust statement before, the best businesses, the ones that make a lot of money, the, the people that best use data, also learn and produce something very robust. They're able to move what they're doing from a medium to a medium. If that, that could mean they're able to market online, and offline. Their product, if they're a multinational, uh, multimedia corporation selling video games and everything else, they're able to transition franchises between mediums. If you're a, a data enterprise company, you're able to go and talk to lots of different companies with lots of different needs and, and be relevant. Companies that are single uh, instance, very specific, not very robust, don't apply to things, tend not to hang around very long. Uh, let's see here. So um, these are some silly and not so silly examples. Uh, it really is about noticing. Forget the philosophy. Uh, I love the, the photo there of the iPad and the plunger because uh, it's my favorite example of a statement I like to say. All uses of everything we produce are, are valid. You learn this as an artist that no matter what you think you put in a painting, no one else thinks you put that in the painting. Well, it turns out, even if you thought you were making a plunger to unclog toilets, it turns out after the iPad is invented, it's actually the cheapest iPad stand ever. And probably it works the other way. I, Apple's probably looking at this kind of thing going, well, probably should make the back of the iPad work really nice with all these little things. We do this so much now, like, abuse the intended use of objects that we've created an entire category of things called life hacking, which is really just using things the way that people who made them didn't intend you to use them. Uh, another example that I just love is, you know, <laughs> bikes. Bikes are also really nice stools. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing that, that if this became a behavior that was very common, I'm sure they would add nice little planks to bikes and we would all be using them to see over things that, that we need to see over. Uh, probably a more serious example though, uh, the question that has raged for a long, long time, what is life? Turns out we're finding out most of our definitions of life, you know, whether it's, it's uh, locomotion, it's replication, it's carbon, it's oxygen, all these different things that we've used to identify life, we're finding weirder and weirder examples of things that are alive. These are these, these little bacterium that just eat electrons. That's what they do. They don't need all this oxygen photosynthesis and all this complicated stuff. They actually just eat the electrons and keep going. Well, this turns out to be really important to people who are working in, in space exploration and, and space biology and whatnot because we didn't know, we spent billions of dollars on SETI and all these things and we didn't know what to look for. Our detectors turn out to be wrong. So now we gotta build new detectors that are able to, one of, the, one of the ways that they're detecting this is, and my parents used to live by a Homestake mine, one of the biggest gold mines in the world, and it's that mine that's a mile down. Uh, it's no longer a mine because 
other than last week, we're not buying and selling lots of gold. It turns out they probably should open the mine up and America would do very well. But they, they stopped mining that a long time ago and it became a major physics research because it's a mile into the ground. And they find that these life forms live very well a mile in the ground in all these old mine pipes that are rusted and have no other signs of life. Um, and then of course, there's a self-portrait of me made out of shells on the beach that probably washed away. Um, but the idea is, how do we know that's a thing? We're just noticing it and you have a database of this, et cetera. Another, I found this and I just wanted to plug it in there to say this isn't total crazy stuff I'm talking about. Uh, this is mind blowing to me what is happening. Uh, I ran into this, this, this company and the set of folks that have done this research. The next wave of online video is not what any of us thought it was going to be. We're actually going to accelerate the viewing experience because researchers have found, we, we knew this about speed reading, right? You can read probably twice or three times as fast as you think you can and absorb the content. They're finding the same is true of videos. You can literally watch, and this is only because Netflix and everybody really wants you to consume even more. They found that comprehension, we can speed these videos up, we can speed the spoken word up almost 2x and not lose any comprehension. I mean, it's just a fascinating thing that like, you didn't know to look for it until you knew to look for it. Um, and I just find this totally bizarre that, that what we really want to do is watch two or three times as much online content. But here we arrive at a dilemma. I, I've said some things that I think are sort of interesting, but here we're, we're at a dilemma. Um, how do you QA all this stuff that I'm talking about? It's very non-deterministic. Uh, and we're very rapidly moving into what is obviously non-deterministic stuff, virtual realities, augmented realities. Uh, I really got smacked in the face of this when I worked at Wolfram Alpha, which was a, a massive QA headache, you can imagine, because it's a very open-ended system that threatens to let you ask it any question and it will compute something useful. Uh, the story I like to tell people is probably one of the best and worst meetings of my life was presenting Wolfram Alpha to five of the CTOs at NASA. You don't get through that conversation very well when they know the physics much better than you. Um, and I literally could not answer for whether the, whether the physics that was coming out of the Wolfram Alpha site was precise enough to their specifications. Uh, and I could find other categories where I literally could not, there, no one on planet Earth would be able to QA it. Uh, this is true of virtual worlds. Uh, of augmented world. In fact, there's lots of companies that are cropping up that simply do bots and they deploy them within these worlds to sort of pull a Star Trek and go explore the expanses of those worlds and report back if they can, if they find weird activity. I think last week was another good example of how is this really going to go in the future? If our politicians are going to live stream from the floor, that's obviously we're going to get popular. If everybody's going to be live streaming everything. Well, Ad models don't really love, advertising models don't really love things that aren't QA. So if we're all going to want to watch live media, I wonder how this conflict's going to be resolved of scrubbing content, but you know, keeping up with the demands of people. Uh, I had to put one of these French dudes uh, quotes in here because they always seem to be totally esoteric and terrible. And then you read it and you're kind of like, maybe he has a point. Uh, but I'll let you read it. The, the idea, you know, he's the guy that kind of inspired the matrix and it's like, you know, maybe we're all, we're building a, an edifice that we really, that seems so real to us, but actually is sort of a comedy, it's not real. Um, and just think it's a relevant quote to stimulate some discussion. So how do I pull it all together and tie this into Hadoop? Uh, data science is simulation is art. I said that earlier. I'm gonna give you a very specific thing. Our systems, our, our development processes, our, our talent pools that we build up, the skills we develop are going to be about this. I'm making a prediction, which will probably not go exactly as planned, but hopefully it's general enough that, that it will be useful. But the idea is that we're going to assess consequences of our choices, our relationships, our decisions, our software, our technologies, uh, by integrating them into a vir a, some sort of virtual reality. You can use virtual in a very broad way simulation, augmented, you could do it a lot of different ways. Uh, and we're gonna have a bunch of complex adaptive agents, avatars, robots, whatever you wanna talk about them as, uh, that are gonna go and s play with this stuff and see how it goes. In fact, that's typically how you do A-B testing anyway, or experimental uh, design, is you, you go make control groups and whatnot, and you give them different scenarios, you see how it goes. I'm saying what big data and Hadoop and data science is allowing us to do is do this at a massive scale to the point at maybe, you know, 
we're starting to reach the upper limits of computation. So I was thinking all about all this stuff, um, and I thought, well, how do you turn this into, you know, how do you make this a little more approachable to people? Uh, and so uh, a bunch of my buddies from various companies I worked at, we now got together and we formed a little company. I'm going to call it Little. It's lightweight. It's meant to be super lightweight. Uh, we call it Case Zero. There's a reason we call it Case Zero. Um, it, we take the null hypothesis seriously. We don't know anything. Uh, we take very broad approach to the technology in the stack. Uh, and our approach is to develop data objects, uh, stories, detectors, and put them out to the world. Uh, we use Hadoop, Elasticsearch, Wolfram Alpha, Inth, a couple other very general products that help us be productive. Uh, everybody can pull this up on their phone if they want. I think it's a good example of the kind of work that we end up producing from everything we do. Uh, data looks dope. Uh, it's a series of visualizations and interactive uh, experiences that explore relationships in various interesting data sets. Um, so very succinctly, we make uh, data detectors. We detect some data. Then we publish what we think we're detecting and measure the behavior of people playing with that data. Uh, so in some, what I like to tell clients is our, our goal isn't to understand necessarily every last drop of data in your business. It's to get something out there to, to start conducting simulations and experiments of what we think we've learned in the day. I know it's very like convoluted, but it's really simple if you go look at some of these examples. Here's a, on, the, on, that, on the right side, that's a little analysis we did of a bunch of terrorism related data. And the idea, you learn a lot uh, by seeing how people interact with data about terrorism. You, you can learn a lot of sentiment analysis and things like that, that I tend to find more useful than endlessly mining the terrorism data itself. Okay, So tie this in, put it on a bow. Hadoop is essential. Um, I've been in many arguments, some I probably shouldn't have been, others that I felt very strongly about, but a lot of them were about, you know, is Hadoop a thing? That was a couple years ago. If it's a thing, um, where does it really sit? What justifies its use? How big a data do you have to have? All these conversations I'm sure some of you are still having. And I, I always came back to this basic concept. Hadoop and the, the ecosystem that it represents is still the most generalized data detectors we have that are cost efficient. Uh, what I care about for what I do in business and art is I want to make sure that I have the most generalized uh, tools available to me to explore the space of as many possibilities as I can. Uh, if you remind yourself of a couple slides ago, uh, if you get in a world of very specialized detectors, the pace at which this world is changing and we're learning new things usually invalidates specialized detectors very, very quickly. I like that Hadoop is one of these weird, ill-defined things. I'm sure most of you have had conversations where business or decision makers are like, well, can you define Hadoop? And it's like, you really can't because every day something new is being added to it and something's being, I mean, this conference is, is different than last year's, different than two years ago. We were talking about yarn two years ago. We're not talking about yarn anymore in most circles. It's all the at the edge computation and things like that. So I just like to make a really simple point on this and hopefully have inspired you guys a little bit to be confident uh, in your investment in Hadoop and these conferences and and everything you're doing inside your businesses, you're gonna keep coming back. Whether, whether you're doing art or you're doing all those weird business I done, uh, you're gonna keep coming back to needing detectors that you can change on the fly and that can scale up uh, at the kind of scale I'm sure some of you are starting to see. Uh, these are some of our people, some of our experience at the end of the day. Um, maybe you think differently, but I know we have lots of machine learning deployed in the world. Uh, the 99% of the work is still being done by a bunch of humans. Uh, and with what we're trying to do as a, as a very small company is not hide from that fact. We like to make the sausage in front of people and teach them uh, ensembles and techniques. We, don't, we just, we just want to go out there and, and try and help people navigate this world uh, and ask questions. We haven't arrived at any answers. Uh, so if you want more information, you can find me all over the web. Uh, there's my art stuff. Uh, find me on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you want. Uh, and there's business about case zero. Show of hands. Was this useful, enlightening, fun, different? Oh, that's pretty good. It's a super wide net. So is that bothersome or good? Well, I think it's, it's despite how wide it is, I'm surprised there's almost no discussion of ethics. Going from philosophy of data, there's no moral philosophy, no ethical philosophy. So if you go back, um, 
to one of the slides about the consequences of simulations. That's my moral statement. I can't make a more specific moral statement without biasing you with my own morality, which I think is part of the issue. I think we learn our morals by looking at the consequences. And I think over time, the only way to understand uh, whether we're comfortable with something is to try it. Hopefully with a virtual world, we're trying it in a, in a way that isn't devastating to actual people or whatever the outcome is. But I'm saying because you know, I, I have all sorts of my own ethics on what is okay or what is not, um, which we could get into and I would highly encourage you, let's have that discussion. But ultimately people are deciding what consequences are okay for them and what aren't. But you, we definitely need systems that help you better ask those questions. Any other questions real quick? Cool. This was awesome. Thank you so much. You guys can find me later today or whatever. If you have questions, uh, find me online. I'm happy to talk to people about pretty much anything. So thank you.